because I do reveal so much drama and backstabbing and kind of a lot of stuff I think that people didn't know that maybe doesn't necessarily reflect well on either Ethereum or crypto. Uh, I've had people say things like, you know, um, does, does this kind of like shake your faith in the technology or anything? And interestingly, actually, it doesn't. <laughs> Welcome back to The Breakdown with me, NLW. It's a daily podcast on macro, Bitcoin, and the big picture power shifts remaking our world. The Breakdown is sponsored by Nexo.io, Arculus, and FTX, and produced and distributed by Coindesk. What's going on, guys? It is Friday, April 8th, and today I am joined by the one and only Laura Shin. Before we get into that interview, however, if you are enjoying The Breakdown, please go subscribe to it, give it a rating, give it a review, or... If you want to get deeper into the conversation, come join us on the Breakers Discord. You can find a link in the show notes or go to bit.ly slash breakdown pod. So Laura Shin needs no introduction. She is the host of the Unchained podcast and really one of the voices of this space. There are so many people whose first experience starting to learn about crypto was listening to her interview people from the industry on her show. Laura is also the author of the new book, The Cryptopians. Idealism, Greed, Lies, and the Making of the First Big Cryptocurrency Craze. As you'll hear on the show, this started out as a book about the ICO boom, but then turned into really the most complete history we've had yet on the founding of Ethereum. In this episode, we get into a bunch of details from the book, her perception of those early days in Ethereum, what the significance of the DAO hack was, and how she came to make a conclusion about who she thought was behind that famous 2016 hack. It's a great show. I know you're going to enjoy it. So without any further ado, let's dive in. One note, I discovered after the interview was complete that the app that I had been using to record it was not feeding into this podcast. So apologies for my sound quality. This is what it would sound like if I'd normally did the show with AirPods. Laura, welcome to The Breakdown. I'm so excited for you to be here. I am so excited to be here. Thanks for having me on the show. Um, so th- this is going to be a ton of fun. I feel like it's long, long overdue, uh, and 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 I'm really excited. I was just telling you, sort of, I'm I'm such a history geek. I love the book, uh, and I'm really excited to dig into it with you. But I think that where where I wanted to start was just um, kind of taking us back to when you actually when did you actually start covering crypto? It was almost seven years ago now. It was May 2015, and. I was doing the Forbes FinTech 50 list. It was the first time we were launching the list. And the other reporter and I just divided it into different categories. And I took the category of digital currency and just became completely obsessed. Um, And I very much like grasped the significance of Bitcoin and blockchain technology pretty much immediately because I remember that I was supposed to do an interview with Adam Ludwin of Chain, which was a company from that era that was doing enterprise blockchain. But at the last minute, he couldn't make it. And Devin Gundry, his COO, did the interview with me. And Devin Gundry is this like very animated person. He had like, you know, wild corkscrew curls. And he was just like talking about Bitcoin, even though they were working on enterprise blockchain, he would just give this like impassioned explanation of Bitcoin. And because I'd been learning so much about what the um, uh, kind of like, Uh, weaknesses were of the banking system. And I was understanding just how it was decades old and all this stuff. I pretty much immediately from that conversation, I just understood this is going to change everything. And I basically became completely obsessed and fell down the rabbit hole. You were really one of the, if not the first mainstream reporter to actually uh, cover this. And I feel like it didn't take long for you to, to venture out on your own, but that's probably my misperception. It was probably a lot longer in, in reality. Well, I actually, at that time, was a freelancer. Um, Forbes was definitely my main client, so most people associated me with Forbes. But I think at that time, maybe it was like, I don't know, 85 to 90% of my income. And then I did a bunch of other, you know, I like wrote for Fast Company and Fortune and just like a bunch of other, I did some corporate things. Like there was a whole bunch of other random side stuff that I did, but that was definitely my main gig. Um, But 
I only went full-time with them in 2017 when they agreed to let me cover crypto full-time because between 2015 and mid-2017, I th- th- there, like there was a period in there where they did offer me another full-time job, but I said, I will only come on and work full-time for you if you let me cover only Bitcoin and what was then called only Bitcoin and blockchain. And they were like, no, because nobody was really very interested in it. And I was generating a ton of page views covering personal finance, which is what I covered for them. And so then only in 2017, when it finally started taking off, did they finally relent. And so I went full time. But yeah, then I ended up quitting fairly quickly within seven months because, um, you know, there was that bubble that year and someone who was helping me with the podcast said, hey, you know, I've been doing research and um, you could make a lot of money from this podcast. Like this is what the other podcasts are charging. You have way more downloads than anybody else. So you could be making X, Y, Z amount. And it was like a lot more than I was making at my job. (laughs) So since I'd always had this idea to write a book, I thought, oh, perfect. I will, um, you know, spend two days a week on the podcast. And I launched a second podcast. So it was, you know, doing two podcasts and then use the rest of the time to work in this book. And so, yeah, it took a while, but finally the book came out. And yeah, that's what I've been doing the last uh, like four years. Um, Yeah. I I mean, I think it's fair to say that for the vast majority at this point of crypto market participants, just in terms of percentages, you have been uh, one of the voices in the space. I mean, it, your podcast has been a starting point for, I think, so many people, you know, and other podcasts kind of have come in and come out and, you know, at various points, you know, focus on different things. But I think you are probably the most consistent long term voice of the space, um, which is, you know, super, super, super cool. And, and I think, you know, I was so excited when you decided to do this book, but it sounds like this book was something that you had in mind from from a really early time i mean you know what made you want to write this particular book and did it did did what it was about change as you were actually kind of working on it oh yeah the proposal looks nothing like the actual book <laughs> um so i have always known since i was actually a little girl that i wanted to be a, a writer um and in particular that i wanted to write books and i've actually written some like ebooks for forbes but you know it's nothing like this and Um, I didn't quite know exactly what the book was going to be, but I knew that when I quit Forbes in early 2018, that I had lived through something historic and I lived through it with a front row seat. And, you know, it, it, like, just when you think about, you know, like I said, at the beginning, when I started covering in 2015, nobody cared, you know, I like write these articles, get like a tiny amount of page views compared to my, uh, personal finance and career stories that would just get like, you know, thousands or, or hundreds of thousands or millions of page views. And then, you know, to live through 2017 and see even my own life change during that period, just because like things just were picking up so much and just it became this global phenomenon in a way that it really hadn't been before. And so, you know, when you have a story, like obviously you're, you know, there's like a natural arc that makes a story. And that felt like that, you know? And so even though I actually didn't really know what the book was going to be, like I had this idea that, um, you know, the, the question I wanted to answer was how did the initial coin offering craze happen? And um, I, initially the idea was like a much bigger book, which like, you know, the book is already 400 pages. And that's after I cut out this whole storyline that involved Coinbase. I did a lot of reporting on Coinbase. And so in the future, I hope to use those notes. Uh, I'm sure all the people that I interviewed also hope I use them. <laughs> um, but I frankly, when I went to write it, I had to cut all that because I just was like, I don't have space. This is like, once I started putting it all down on paper, I was like, whoa, like this is taking a lot more time to get through. And I just was like, have to cut the Coinbase piece. Yes, it was a big on-ramp, but really what catalyzed the initial coin offering craze was basically Ethereum. You know, that was because Coinbase is, or at least up until now, has been more like a fintech company, just like being that rail from the traditional financial system into the crypto ecosystem. And so it wasn't necessarily quite as pivotal, but Ethereum really was what enabled that ICO craze. So that's what... um, that's why kind of like 75% of the book is more of like a history of Ethereum. And then only at the end, you know, do we get to the ICO part? Yeah, I mean, listen, I think there could be an entire uh, additional book about just the the ICO moment. Um, and I want to come back to that in a minute. But let's talk about uh, Ethereum a little bit. So, you know, as you dig into this, wh- how, I mean, this is a very broad question, but how was your perception of the founding of Ethereum, having watched it in an active kind of bystander position, different once you went back and started to look at it in the context of this this history that you were writing? 
Oh my gosh. I barely knew any of the stuff that ended up being in my book. I mean, I know so much of it is news in general, uh, had not been covered before anywhere. So, you know, I mean, I did not know most of it. There's kind of this one email chain that I recount toward the end of the book where people are discussing getting rid of how, how they would like to get rid of what uh, the person who was then the executive director of the Ethereum Foundation, Ming Chan. And I had um, gotten that at that time and knew kind of like there was just a little bit of discontent. I did not know that really that was years in the making. So there were just so many things that I really did not know. Um, you know, like even details about um, how the early co-founders had a falling out and some of them got kicked out and stuff. You know, I really feel like I did not even know much of that. Um, I don't even think I understood really just kind of like why there were so many co-founders. Um, and so I just learned so many details about really all of it that, no, I had barely any idea. And even stuff like the Dow that had made headlines, like I, I really knew almost nothing. I mean, the Dow um, is kind of like, what I cover in my book is roughly maybe like, um, four or five months. And uh, those four or five months take up four chapters in the book. <laughs> and uh, the rest of it like, takes, you know, spans over the course of years. And so um, just the level of detail I was able to get for that period was just stuff I really did not know. And yeah, uh, frankly, um, I do think a lot of people also are just learning a lot more because even if you were following along, there's there's just so much that was happening in the different quarters and camps. And so I actually personally think that I may be the one who like knows the most because I was able to talk to you know more than 200 people and get all these stories from these different perspectives and then tie it all together. So I, I, that's actually what, one of the things that I wanted to ask you about. It's a little bit of a kind of a meta or process question, but, you know, this is, I think, certainly at this stage, the most complete history of something that will inevitably have lots and lots and lots of books written about it, right? It, it's just if, I mean, unless this technology goes away tomorrow and, and you know, it's, it ceases to be relevant, which I, doesn't really seem like it is the is the trajectory. How do you go about doing that? How much is it oral history from people kind of reporting their memories? How much of it is people sharing actual primary source documents like email chains? And then how much, like, how do you go about the process of caveating, filtering out, you know, cross-referencing people's takes on things, you know, just, you know, it's, I mean, it's an, it's an inherently messy business, you know? Yeah. Oh my God. I cannot quantify any of that, but there is plenty of all of those things all over the book. So I did, you know, like I said, more than 200 interviews. And so what you find is you will generally for certain stories, you might get like multiple people that kind of view things the same way. And then maybe just a few outliers or um, when there's like contentious things, you might realize like, oh, there were two camps or things like that. Um, so oftentimes though, when people are telling me things, I would ask them for backup, like anything contemporaneous is super, super, super useful. Um, frankly, you know, one thing that I struggled with was in the beginning when people would talk about that executive director, Ming Chan, the way they were talking about her, it just seemed almost unreal. Um, you know, very exaggerated and, and just like unbelievable. Um, but it was only when they sent me, you know, chats and um, her, like she could basically speak. Uh, she wasn't speaking obviously to me, but, you know, I could see her in her own words. Then I began to understand um, because otherwise it just sort of seemed like very exaggerated and sort of like this caricature. Um, so, you know, there was a lot of that. I got recordings, I got, um, videos, photos. Um, I spent a lot of time on the Wayback machine, like a lot of time. Um, I even did things like, you know, for certain things, like when the Dow attack occurred, I was trying to do what we call in journalism, a TikTok, where it's like minute to minute, like this happened, then this happened, then this happened, then this happened. And I would have to, uh, email these different websites and be like, so the time that's displayed here, is it my time or is it UTC time? Or like, like I was trying to fit, you know, cause it would be like this post happened at blah, blah, blah time, but it would not tell you the time zone. So then I had to like piece all that together and like put that in a timeline. And like, cause you know, I wanted to know like what, like who, or who was the first person to post online that this Dow attack was happening, stuff like that. Um, so it just, I mean, it was like truly a labor of love. I mean, it was very fun for me. I'm not going to lie. It was like, yes, a lot of work, but Writing this book was the most fun I've had professionally 
like by and large, you know, I mean, I love doing the podcast because I'm a naturally social person, but you know, I'm a creative person and, um, yeah, for a creative person, you kind of need that like alone time where you're just like you and your work, you're doing your thing, you're in the flow. And like so much of the book was, was that for me. And I really enjoyed it as hard as it was. One other last piece I want to talk about is, you know, of course, as you read about in the book, a lot of the people in it do not like each other. And so when people were saying negative things to each other, you know, you always wanted to go to that person, ask for a response. And so I know that, you know, there are parts of the book where it's a little bit like blah, blah, blah happened, but then it'll be like, well, so-and-so denies it or, you know, what? And so you just have to always include that. But like, I feel that, you know, for those people that maybe felt that they were being put in a negative light, that it was good if they were able to include their voice and have their perspective heard. Um, you know, so that was like another tricky thing. And, you know, I just wanted to make sure I gave everybody um, any opportunity possible to to have their uh, opinion heard. Yeah. I, how important do you think it is? I mean, I, I guess the answer is probably pretty important considering how much time you spent on it. Uh, is it to, you know, th this is an industry, this is not even really an industry. It's a, a philosophical approach to thinking about human networks and human organization that is very different than the types of organizing structures that we have today that we've had for a very long time that we've had used to, but they still had to start with groups of people how, you know, when, as you were digging back into the history, where, you know, what was your sense of sort of the, um, you know, where the ideals of decentralization kind of fit in those early days? Like how much was sort of, uh, you know, uh, I mean, to your point, Ethereum in a lot of ways kicked off an entirely new kind of generation of the crypto industry, which has, been sort of progressing in fits and starts towards these new kind of decentralized structures for a while. But I, I think, you know, the, the great critique and, and sort of albatross is how decentralized can it really be? So yeah. I'm, I guess I'm, I'm interested in kind of like, you know, looking at this early kind of, um, you know, Cambrian explosion type of moment, you know, Big Bang type of moment. There's so much, so much personality and sort of like messy humanness. Yes, which is what people will read about in the book. Um, you know, Vitalik himself definitely kind of lives those ideals of decentralization. And, um, you know, I have that word idealism in the title, and I do feel that he is one of the characters that best represents that. But, you know, he was 19 when he came up with the idea for Ethereum. And I say this in the book, he sent out the white paper for Ethereum to a small group of friends. And it was on the day that Bitcoin crossed $1,000 for the first time. So this was a moment when like people were recognizing like, oh, we can get rich off of this. Like there were now Bitcoin millionaires. And, um, you know, there was this sense of like, oh, well, you know, I was in on Bitcoin early. And now that the price has appreciated, now I'm super wealthy. And oh, if I get in on the ground floor of Ethereum, the same thing could happen to me as well. And so you have these people that get involved in Ethereum early on. And, you know, it does seem that they were pretty self-interested. Um, there's a few moments that you read about where Vitalik, you know, had these notions that Ethereum should be launched as what we would now call a fair launch coin, meaning no pre-mine, you know, do it like Bitcoin. Um, and, you know, he kind of was outvoted by some people that I think others would perceive as being more self-interested. And um, that's why, you know, there was this free mine and then there were what are called early contributor allocations, which, you know, continued to become uh, controversial later on. And even to this day, I've had sources say things to me like, oh, you know, um, Vitalik himself didn't even get as much of the early all allocation as he really should have based on his contribution, things like that. Um, so, you know, all of those kind of human factors definitely affected that early um, creation of Ethereum. Whether or not that means anything negative about the technology today, I think just probably depends on your opinion. Um, frankly, I feel that the technology itself has just succeeded in a way that it's sort of um, just like, supersedes any of any of those issues that, uh, you know, I sort of feel um, just in a way don't really matter as much today. But I do I get I get tagged a lot in tweets where other people don't seem to agree with that. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, to each their own. Yeah, listen, uh, original sins are a, are a hard thing to shake if that's the perception that, that one has of them. Look 
Looking for ways to step up your crypto game? Then go with Nexo. For starters, you get free crypto for each purchase or swap. How about earning guaranteed yields? Up to 17% paid out daily. Ideal for you hardcore hodlers. You don't even need to sell. Instead, borrow instant cash against your assets. Get the most out of your crypto with Nexo at nexo.io. That's nexo.io. Meet Arculus, the next generation cold storage wallet. Arculus secures your crypto using three factor authentication, providing a simpler, safer, and smarter way to store, buy, swap, send, and receive crypto. Arculus is offline cold storage. Your private keys are encrypted on the Arculus keycard and are never online. Stay safe from hackers with no cords, no charging, no Bluetooth. Just crypto security made simple. Buy Arculus on Amazon today. The Breakdown is sponsored by FTX US. FTX US is the safe, regulated way to buy and sell Bitcoin and other digital assets with up to 85% lower fees than competitors. There are no fixed minimum fees, no ACH transaction fees, and no withdrawal fees. One of the largest exchanges in the US, FTX US is also the only leading exchange that supports both Ethereum and Solana NFTs. When you trade NFTs on FTX, you pay no gas fees. Download the FTX app today and use referral code BREAKDOWN to support the show. You pair kind of greed and idealism a lot. This is sort of like the, the central kind of tension and contrast. How much do you think they're both necessary for crypto to have evolved the way that it did? You know, it, it, you know one of the things that I think people often recognize if they're kind of realists in the space is that uh, although it's not necessarily the, the part of the industry that we want to kind of hold up and double down on, the, the monetary incentive has been such a huge driver of people coming into this space and building things. I mean, is that what you found is sort of like that these things were both necessary or do you think that there could have been kind of a, a pure, better version, you know, in a different set of configurations? That's such an interesting question. Um, I mean, obviously, you know, I, I'm an American and I believe in capitalism. Um, you know, my ancestors come from Korea, which now is divided into a place that's like a mini communist country and a mini capitalist country and or U.S. country. And like definitely the version that's more like the U.S. is the better way to go. <laughs> so, you know, I, I have strong opinions about things like that. But, um, you know, obviously things in moderation, you know, I definitely wouldn't say that if the people that were more self-interested had truly, truly dominated that then Ethereum would be the success that it is. You know, I do feel that, um, frankly, as you see early in the book, there's these conflicts that occur between the devs or developers and the business guys. And the developers always end up winning. And I actually think that was to Ethereum's benefit. And the business guys were the ones who, you know, wanted to make it closed source and they didn't want to um, uh, have it be decentralized. They wanted it to be, you know, more like a Web2 company where they're using uh, uh customer data and profiting off of it and things like that. And so do I think Ethereum would be as successful today if it were built like that? No, I don't. Um, so it's just kind of, um, yeah, it's probably like a, a um, push and pull sort of dynamic. Um, and if you go too far, maybe in one direction, then it won't work. And if you go too far in the other, it'll, it also won't work. Yeah, that's super interesting. So the, the other thing that I wanted to ask you about is sort of the... Um, you know, like you said, there's four chapters on on the DAO hack. I'm interested in your you, like almost the um, the emotional, you know, kind of impact of that. Like bringing us back into that moment, th those moments when people learned. You know, you're saying you're kind of compiling the TikTok. Like I think it's hard for people who have come into the industry much later to understand how significant and scary and existential it felt to people. I mean, was that what you found when you kind of went when dug into it? Yes. I mean, so you sh people should understand that when the DAO launched, Ethereum was not even a year old. It had launched in July 2015, and the DAO crowd sale got going April 30th of 2016, and it lasted for a month. And Ethereum was not easy to use at that time. And amazingly, the DAO became the highest crowdfunded project in all history. 
Um, even though it was kind of like, you know, this weird technological thing and whatever. I mean, it was just like a very technologically challenging thing. I mean, obviously there were some exchanges that made it easier to participate, which is why I think, you know, they were able to amass so much money, but there was so much excitement. It was really the first decentralized application on Ethereum that had kind of amassed um, a critical amount of interest. And then, uh, and, and it was so much interest, in fact, that it had garnered 15% of all ETH in the DAO. <laughs> so a few weeks later, it gets hacked. 31% of ETH taken out of the DAO in the span of a few hours. And now this malicious actor had 5% of all ETH. <laughs> so clearly this was something where, you know, I mean, it's just like that, um, that screaming emoji that looks like the Edward Munch painting, you know? <laughs> and, um, you know, this created this existential crisis for Ethereum. I think it's the only existential crisis Ethereum has ever faced. Um, but the community was lucky because the hacker was only able to move the money to a place where the money would be trapped there for 28 days. And they wouldn't be able to access it uh, during that span of time. And that gave the community a window of time in which to try to do something to kind of like reverse the hack or steal the money back or whatever it might be. Um, and so, you know, then this whole thing ensues and it really was, um, you know, excuse my French, but a show. They, um, you know, had all these different options and like one by one, they keep having to um, be like, that's not going to work. That's not going to work. And then finally their, their main option that they're left with is to do what is known as a hard fork, where they're going to split the chain in two and create this new chain where on that new chain, they kind of, uh, just move all the money from all from the DAO and then all the like baby DAOs that had sprouted from it and just put it all in this withdrawal contract where people can send in their DAO tokens and receive back their ether that they had had um, originally invested. And um, because this was known as a contentious hard fork, it ran the risk of the blockchain splitting. And that is exactly what happened, which is how now we have the evil twin, Ethereum Classic. Um, but, you know, throughout this period, I mean, it was like emotions ran high. Um, you had, again, this kind of like, dynamic between the developers and then the business people, which in this case were the exchange owners. They had different views on how it should be handled, you know, like what should be done and why. Um, and, you know, it's just, I mean, it is part of kind of the whole crypto community right now where there is there is a difference between the people who are kind of more in it for the tech and the people who are more in it for the money, the developers versus the traders. And so, yeah, this kind of like, uh, you know, sort of speaking at cross purposes between the two groups is, uh, I think, what led to the birth of Ethereum Classic. Um, but yeah, that that whole period was um, definitely one where I think a lot of people were understanding this was sort of like a do or die moment because Ethereum was so young. Uh, but some people came out on the side of it's so young, we can do this kind of drastic measure to save the ecosystem. And other people, you know, felt like it's so young. Um, just this application on Ethereum doesn't matter. We're going to move on. And, you know, so it was a disconnect between the two. And that's why we have two, two chains today. Super fascinating. It's, it's like, it's almost inconceivable now. It's, you know, it's not that far ago, but it's so hard to imagine something like that in the, in the, you know, kind of the modern context. Um, so when you, when, when the book was released, you dropped this bombshell that as part of the research, you had uh, sort of, you know, you had a theory of who you thought the DAO hacker was. How did that come about? So to my mind, this is sort of the meteor out of nowhere. Um, what happened was I had actually followed through on an investigation that started in 2016. Um, there was a certain group of suspects uh, from that. And I kind of, you know, and, and it was like certain transactions that had been flagged as suspicious that cast light on these people. So I investigated kind of what was actually happening with those transactions. Um, you know, I talked to all those people and then I wrote up something for the book where it was just kind of laying out, you know, what caused them to fall under suspicion, what actually was going on with those transactions, what were their responses to my line of questioning about whether or not they had been involved in the hack. And I didn't come to any conclusions. I just sort of laid out the evidence and, um, left it for the reader to decide. And we were in um, what were called uh, the final passes for the book. So, you know, you submit a first draft, it gets edited. Um, I, in my case, had to revise mine, got edited again. Then when the book is close to being done, you do these three final passes. And with each final pass, it goes to the publisher, they make their changes. It goes to me, I make my changes 
back to them, blah, blah, blah. And with each pass, you're supposed to make fewer and fewer changes. So the publisher's already done its second pass and I'm making mine and I'm working very closely with my fact checker um, who I had to hire to, to check everything in the book. And um, <laughs> I'm supposed to make probably like a hundred changes or fewer. And what happens is Alex, Alex Van de Sand, who was involved in rescuing um, the remaining Dow funds so that they would not also be hacked, uh, reached out to me and he's Brazilian. And he said, hey, six or five years ago, the Brazilian government opened an investigation into the Dow and by extension into me. And I would like to commission a report to exonerate myself. And, I, you know, these reports are a little bit expensive. And he thought, who else could benefit from this report? And he thought of me for my book. And so he got a discount on the report in exchange for me crediting this company coin firm in the book. And after we got the report, which was of all the transactions that the Dow hacker had made after the hack where they had been trying to convert their remaining Ethereum classic into Bitcoin, um, which they were doing because Ethereum classic was so new, it wasn't very liquid and there were very few places where you could use it. But Bitcoin you know, was then and still is the most liquid crypto, the most, the most usable. And um, they had to do this by using Shapeshift because it wasn't taking identifying information. And um, since Shapeshift didn't take identifying information, there was a maximum amount that you could exchange each time, which was $2,500. So they had this huge amount of money, but they had to do like very small transactions to try to convert it to something usable. And so um, Alex and I kind of like went over those transactions and we noticed certain patterns. And one of them was that the times on those transactions kind of mapped onto what was like an Asian morning to night schedule. But the people that I'd been looking at, they were all based in Europe and we kind of checked their social media um, against those cash out times and they were just different hours. So it like sort of felt like, okay, they're not online at the same time or could they be like waking up in the middle of the night to do the transactions or, you know, what's going on? Um, and so one other thing was, you know, this detail about the Asian more, um, schedule was that I had gotten a customer service email that the Dow attacker had sent to Shapeshift back when they were kind of putting all the money in the different smart contracts to, to perpetrate the hack. And I saw from those emails, I mean, one in particular, two of them were so short that they didn't really reveal much. But one of them, even though it was only two sentences, it was very clear this person was a fluent English speaker because it was like um, not even just perfect English, but it was written in shorthand. So it would be like if you said, you know, not I am going to the store. Do you want anything? But going to the store, do you want anything? you know, that kind of thing. And so I was just like, okay, this person is, they're fluent in English. So um, what happened was I sent that information to Chainalysis, which is another company that I'd been working with. And they did not reveal to me until later um, that they had the ability to demix Wasabi transactions because the hacker had taken the Bitcoin they'd received and tried to mix it in a Wasabi, what's called a coin join, where the coins get mixed with like you know, a bunch of other people's coins, and then it obscures the trail backward. Um, but they followed the Wasabi output to four different exchanges. And of course, exchanges have privacy policies. Um, so, you know, they're not going to reveal to you uh, whose name is on any specific account. But I was able to get information on what happened to the Bitcoin at one of those exchanges. Um, it was revealed to a source. And uh, we found out that the money had been withdrawn, had been converted to Grin, which is a privacy coin, and then withdrawn to a Grin node. And the Grin node had a human readable address, which was grin.toby.ai. So the person who I believe is the DAO attacker is somebody named Toby Honish. He has used Toby AI has, as his alias on Reddit and Twitter and GitHub and Stack Overflow and AngelList and you know all these different sites. It was like 16 Medium. Um, and... Uh, in addition, the same IP address of that Grin node was also hosting Bitcoin Lightning nodes. One of those Bitcoin Lightning nodes was named 10X, and Toby's company was named 10X. And so that you know was was really good evidence. Later, I was a also able a couple weeks later to find out the email address on that account, and it was one that ended in at Toby.ai. But meanwhile, I had also gone back to find out what was he doing at the time of the hack. First of all, he was very into the DAO. Um, you know, 
uh, he identified flaws in the DAO. He reached out to the creators about those saying, hey, you, you guys need to fix this. They felt it wasn't super urgent. They, they acknowledged that these were weaknesses, but didn't feel that it had to be changed immediately. And he starts blogging about these vulnerabilities. And then post-hack, he's tweeting things that are kind of like against the hard fork and pro keeping the hack. <laughs> so, you know, just everything fit both in terms of uh, after the cashing out and, and converting to Bitcoin, but then also back when you go to what was happening uh, at the time of the hack. So, you know, in my opinion, it's super strong. I've had no pushback since revealing this. Nobody said like, you're wrong or anything like that. Um, so I think, you know, by and large, a lot of the community finds the evidence very credible. Note to self, do not use NLW in my addresses when I'm trying to get get, get rid of my purloined funds in the, in the future if, uh, if podcasting stops paying enough. Um, no, I, it's, I mean, it's, it's amazing. And it's amazing how that kind of story came together. And I think uh, a testament to, to all the hard work you put into really getting this story. I, I guess, you know, I, I'm really interested to know if and how going back and doing this research made you look at the current crypto industry differently or changed your perception in any ways? Um, so because I do reveal so much drama and backstabbing and kind of a lot of stuff, I think that people didn't know that maybe doesn't necessarily reflect well on either Ethereum or crypto. Uh, I've had people say things like, you know, um, does, does this kind of like shake your faith in the technology or anything? And interestingly, actually, it doesn't. <laughs> um, people might be surprised to hear that. Um, you know, I do feel that I have learned about how these interpersonal dynamics can affect the development of things. Um, you know, I talked kind of about the pre-mine issue with Ethereum and how I think that the personalities involved did affect the initial founding of Ethereum. But, you know, I actually don't know if I would say that that really detracts from Ethereum's success. Like the metrics speak for themselves. You know, it's definitely got by and large the uh, far and away the largest developer ecosystem. It continues to attract 20 to 25 percent of all new developers coming to Web3, which is amazing. I mean, no crypto ecosystem comes even close. So, you know, uh, all of this is kind of despite all the drama that it endured. Um, I, in general, you know, I sort of feel like those early moments when I was falling down the crypto rabbit hole, like, you know, I really became enamored with the technology and found it fascinating. And I, you know, to this day still think it's very interesting, very promising. Um, and, you know, we've seen a lot of, uh, just really innovative and, um, uh, you know, not seen before, uh, capabilities with this technology. And I think we're going to continue to see that. Um, however, you know, things like, uh, as people will read about in the book, Gavin Wood kind of, you know, has a tendency to maybe rub people the wrong way. And so later on when the polka dot ICO, the vast majority of the polka dot ICO funds get frozen, um, I do wonder if some of those political issues about him kind of, um, yeah, maybe <laughs> getting under the skin of some of the people in Ethereum, if that then had an influence on how willing people were to help him, um, you know, other things like that. So we'll continue probably to see some of these personality issues affect some of these blockchains. Um, but I don't think necessarily that um, that means that because people are flawed, that the technology will fail. Yeah, I, I think it's interesting. I, I think I definitely am, am someone who rejects pretty aggressively the uh any sort of line of like don't bring up the old warts you know when it comes to when it comes to the crypto industry i think it is a mass one way to view it is this mass experiment in new types of organization and new norms of organization and that's very much a destination uh and, and this is sort of not a um, uh, apologism for you know places of you know creeping centralization or places where it you know things are a lot more centralized than we like to to, to believe but I think that you sort of uh, going back and understanding the genesis of things doesn't detract from them necessarily. You know, it, it is sort of I mean, it, it can you like people are free in a free market to choose what they kind of do and don't want to affiliate with, you know. But um, I, I think it's super important to kind of have these understandings. And 
you know, to the extent that those early personality clashes shaped the way that those people were able to or not to do things in the future. That's sort of the, the, the way the world works, right? Um, yeah. And actually, one other point is that um, I did want to say that to me, it was so important to try to to try as hard as I can to get everything very accurately. And, you know, uh, I have a podcast. I have crypto companies that are sponsoring that podcast. Um, You know, it's good if I have access to sources to get them on the show. However, I did not let any of that um, affect how I was going to tell the story. I didn't try to pull any punches or, um, you know, try to put a positive spin on things. I just wanted to tell it like it is because I really feel like you, that history is really important and the facts and accuracy, it's all important. And so will Vitalik ever come on my show again? Maybe not. Um, but you know, I can continue to cover him and Ethereum in other ways. And, you know, it just, I really was looking at people a hundred years from now and thinking, I want them to know what happened. And that was really my goal with the book. So you ended up not being able to spend as much time on this, but how do you think, you know, how how is your perception or, or assessment of the ICO boom, that kind of insane moment changed, you know, five, five years on from, from when it actually happened? Honestly, it doesn't seem like it's changed a lot if you're following what's going on in NFTs. Um, you know, it's kind of the same thing. It's like there's this gold rush moment and then all these kind of scammers get in and there's all these rug pulls and phishing incidents. And so, you know, kind of the people who um, are opportunists in uh, a very um, nefarious way are out in full force again. And, um, you know, it's sort of like sharks in the water. They smell the blood and they're going to go after your private keys and your NFTs and whatever else they can. Um, So, you know, I think it's like a big learning moment. I think, um, you know, we're seeing, yeah, just that um, when you have these speculative periods that uh, it's going to attract um, kind of bad actors, basically. However, um, you know, something that I find really interesting is that, um, even though the vast majority of the ICOs uh, didn't pan out, obviously, uh, crypto itself is um, succeeding in so many ways to the point where, uh, you know, the technology kind of can't even keep up with the demand. And a lot of the things that were ideas at that time have now become real things that people are using in crypto. I mean, um, obviously, uh, you know, as I just mentioned, scaling issues kind of limits the amount of uh the, the amount that people can participate in DeFi. But still, you know, we have seen that um, borrowing and lending or using DEXs uh, is something that people will do and are interested in doing. Um, so I don't doubt uh, for any second that a lot of the things that we are seeing percolate right now will also someday pan out into something real. But um, as the ICO craze shows us, uh, there is kind of that moment you have to get through where there's a lot of froth and you have to do a lot of sifting to find that gold. Um, but as time goes on, uh, those things will emerge and will become used. I, I really want to, at some point, I hope that you do the, the early Coinbase book uh, or just even go, just go back even farther in history. There's so many interesting stories, you know, back in the, you know, the, the Bitcoin talk days too. Um I guess, you know, by way of wrapping up, uh, I want to leave some some amount of the book for people to actually read uh, instead of just asking you about all of it. You know, you you have a unique vantage point. You, you know, talk with so many different people in the industry. You went deep on this analysis. You know, what do you think is something that the crypto industry should be talking about more than it is right now? Huh. Um that's a good question. I could go in so many different directions with this. Um, you know, I a co- so a couple of things, uh, and they're so basic, um, but I find it interesting that we're this far along and still these are stumbling blocks for the industry. Um, so in my mind, they're sort of low-hanging fruit. Um, but the first would probably be like how it is that we talk about this technology and relay um, – you know, the benefits and the um, kind of pitfalls of it to to other people. I actually just wrapped recording one of my own podcasts in which this came up. And um, 
someone in that show mentioned that uh, the word trustless is something that sounds negative to people outside of crypto. And um, they were commenting on how the other person in the show used the word trust based and how that sounds more positive and is actually what you mean, because I've always felt that trustless didn't make any sense because I'm like, wait, but the software is providing the trust. So how is it trustless? Like, like it's confusing to me just on a, a basic like meaning level. Um, so things like that, you know, I feel that basically, you know, we're all seeing this, it's seeing this in the regulatory hearings or the um, hearings with lawmakers where um, they have basically pretty outdated conceptions around crypto. Um, you know, in terms of like, oh, it's only for people who are criminals and whatever, um, when in fact there's way less crime being done, uh, illicit, way less ex uh, illicit activity being done in crypto than in the traditional financial system. Uh, so, you know, just kind of uh, the way people are talking about this, I think definitely could be improved and like messaging could be improved. Um, but then the other, frankly, is um, just teaching people how this money is different from other kinds of money and therefore how you need to secure it um, before you're going to engage with it in any meaningful way. You know, we still all today see so many incidents of people being fished or like losing their money or having their phone number stolen and then all their crypto is transferred out of their account. And, you know, these things have been going on for years. And um, I just feel like that kind of education, like if, if people enter the space and then their first experience is being burned in some fashion, that's not good. <laughs> so, um, you know, I, I just would hope that people aren't saying to all their friends like, hey, you should buy these cryptos, you're going to get rich. It should instead be, hey, buy a little bit of crypto, learn how it's different from other kinds of money so you don't lose it once you actually put some significant amount in. And then, you know, then we can talk about like actually making money from this or, or whatever it is. Um, but, you know, until we get there, I feel like people are going to have either misconceptions about the technology or bad experiences from the start. And it's not good. Well, uh, Laura, is Awesome to have you on the show. Um, congrats again on the book. Uh, it's really excellent. Uh, and, and thrilled to, to be able to talk with you about it. Um, let's do this again sometime soon. Thanks so much for having me. I really enjoyed this. Reflecting on that show, I think the one thing I want to double click on is just this inherent messiness of decentralization. I said in the conversation that I had with Laura that I thought that we shouldn't shirk away from our history that if this is a long-term experiment that succeeds in changing the way that human networks can organize, it's going to have to go through these warty phases of real human problems and intrigue and controversy and challenge. So much of the promise of this technology is in its decentralization and all of the implications that has for things like censorship resistance. I don't think it behooves us to be anything other than unflinching when it comes to understanding truly how decentralized or not any given network or project is. I really enjoyed this book and I really enjoyed this conversation and I highly recommend you go check out The Cryptopians. Thanks again to Laura for coming on the show and thanks to my sponsors Nexo.io, Arculus and FTX for supporting the show and thanks to you guys for listening. Until tomorrow, be safe and take care of each other. Peace. Hey, Breakdown listeners, come join Coindesk's Consensus 2022, the festival for the decentralized world this June 9th through the 12th in Austin, Texas. This is the only festival showcasing and celebrating all sides of blockchain, crypto ecosystems, Web3, and the metaverse, and is designed for crypto newbies, investors, entrepreneurs, developers, and creators. Don't miss speakers like Kathy Wood, SBF, CZ, Punk6529, and Joe Lubin to name just a few. Use code BREAKDOWN to get 15% off your pass at coindesk.com slash consensus2022.